So good morning everybody out there on what is known to some as Easter Sunday. The actual 14th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar doesn't come for another couple of weeks yet. But people are thinking of Jesus as being risen from the dead on this Sunday. And he was crucified then on a Friday. There's nothing to argue about there. All this three days, three nights. So we've gone through that. Not, not difficult. But as I want to repeat then, the real Jewish calendar, which we're, we're not particularly keeping, but it's worth noting, is not for another couple of weeks, I think Shah was saying. And then the Jews will be keeping their Passover, which is the right, the right date. Anyway, <clears throat> that's um, our custom on every week, on every resurrection day, every first day of the week. We do start by reciting, reciting the Shema. The Shema is the Hebrew word for listen, and it was the greatest of all commandments. It's a marvel to me that we never hear about that in church. I mean, there are thousands, millions of people flocking to church today. They don't know what the Shema is. I, I, I'm not the judge of this. I'm glad I'm not. But if I were God, I'd be a jealous God. You know, I'd want my name to be clear. So the Shema is the grace of all commandments. It goes like this. Shema Israel Adonai. Adonai. And I want to tell you that one means one. Your child of two understands that. But you're told by the system, which is very corrupt and very crooked, that one is really compound one. After all, Adam and Eve were one flesh. So you go, see, one really means two. That is so clever and yet so elementarily stupid that we do need to help our friends to see that it's not that. Echad means one. It's the cardinal number one. God is one person. That's not known in these churches out there. Does it make us smarter than anybody else? I don't mean that. But some sort of miracle has happened to us that we've been pursuing the idea of God being one. If you're God, you're jealous. Are you not? You're jealous of any rivals. I'd be very jealous if I were God. If I created the universe, we're going to talk about that in a moment, based on Jeremiah 27, verse 5, you've got something to be proud of. And you'd be very angry with anybody interrupting or modifying your wonder. All right, so that's... <clears throat> the one God Shema, pray. and we will then open, if we may, with prayer this morning. Our Father, we do celebrate the fact that you are the creator of everything we see out there, the creator of the human beings that we are mixing and mingling with, but you made this extraordinary world that we see, we tend to take for granted, we shouldn't, we thank you for this marvelous creation around us. We do pray, as you commanded us, Jesus, to pray, may your kingdom come, because that's a solution to all the problems that were set up in Genesis 1. That's the resolution of all the problems where Adam went wrong. We see where the second Adam went right. And we're praying for that day to be fulfilled, that the nations would give up killing each other, that they would give up aborting their children, that they would repent of the madness of death. We're very keen to be on one track with you on that point. May that day come soon. May the world be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. Be with us now, we pray. By your giving us your operational presence and power, the mind of Jesus to guide the conversation we have. We're thankful for everybody who came today. Ask you to bless their experience and strengthen them for the weeks and the months that lie ahead. We're praying all of these things as we do week by week in the name of the Messiah, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Sarah's got, a... Sarah's got some things to say. Okay. Just a letter from a prisoner. Oh, yes, that was nice. Carolina. Good, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He says, our ministry here in prison has not slowed up, even though this is a ministry always in transition due to transition transfers and people going home uh, okay all right we're back okay. to <laughs> uh, we now have four different yard ministries mm -hmm. last sunday we do our best with what god has given us to work with we do have a one-sided shed to meet in if it is not raining too hard but if it is raining and the wind is blowing we get wet 
but we still come together. I remind each of our people of truth. What is rain compared to what the only begotten son went through for us? We have five people now who hold a leadership role in ministry, training and one-on-one -on -one sharing truth from scripture. Ah, yep. That's North Carolina. Yep. Wow. Okay. You have a comment at all? From the mail? Uh, Very yep. Urgent. Just uh, apologies for that, folks. Yep. Lois. <laughs> yep. Let's see, we have a few comments here from the internet mm -hmm. so on the video the word of the lord trying to read some bible passages using our western perspective will lead us into confusion mm -hmm. as in translation from one language to another without knowing the idioms will mm -hmm. make the translation difficult sometimes without meaning so this is in reference to john 1 yes. 1. um <laughs> a running a running nose to a spanish speaker will mean that the nose is literally running with its own legs. <laughs> Thus explaining running. that the nose runs mm -hmm. as water runs will make the connection in mm -hmm. their mind and will be understood. This is a simple one, but there are more complex ones in every language. So just <laughs> okay. about the language. Yep. All right. Yeah, okay. That reminds me then of, of Daniel 12 verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse, the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. How about being a star? Have you heard of Hollywood? Does America celebrate Hollywood? You bet. What does the Bible celebrate? Those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars. That is extraordinary to me. We need not to shy away from those extraordinary promises. Anyway, that's Revelation or rather Daniel 12, verse 3, one of your refrigerator verses. If you want to be a star, then here's how you do it. You bring others to insight and understanding. Shine like the stars. That's the lady. The okay. conference. Conference coming up on the, the Friday. This Friday, Friday is this Friday. April 5. April 5. Uh, I think about, what, the 33rd or so annual conference we've been doing. 30 plus. 30 plus. And we have a number of speakers. I think you'll find that of interest. And so what time does that begin on Friday? 7 p.m. with Pastor Robin Todd. Okay, with Robin Todd speaking, first of all, who has his own program on a Monday uh, every week on the kingdom. And you'll find him, I think, very solid and very straight on the gospel about the kingdom of God, which is what we're all about. Okay, with that in mind then, anything else? What can you tell us about the about the conference, like why you started it, the purpose, oh. what you hope for the conference. Yeah, the conference is, uh, it used to be held face to face in various places, once in the <coughs> north part of Atlanta and then down here in Fayetteville area, but that became too difficult. And so we're doing it online, but you can get together online and share these truths with you. I'm going to be concentrating as we do Genesis chapter 1 and 2 on a verse that's really been haunting me for a long time. It's Jeremiah 27 verse 5. You don't know what it says. Nobody does. Jeremiah 27 5 says, God speaking, I am God. I made the heavens and the earth. I made the trees. I made all the good things, the birds and the bees and the flowers. What does it say then? And I will what? Give it. I will give it. To the one who is pleasing in my sight what look outside that belongs to you potentially that you see is why jesus preached the kingdom because he was smart enough to see he knowing the bible well he could see what adam went wrong god said take care of this wonderful garden i've i've given you what did they do they disobeyed they got it all wrong so jesus comes along and says i am the second adam I'm going to fix it by preaching what the gospel of the kingdom the kingdom is a restored world and it belongs to you potentially that's amazing <clears throat> jeremiah 27 verse 5 i will give that it's a very generous god isn't it to give you the whole creation i find that very impressive that's why jesus preaches the gospel of the kingdom but out there in the land of billy graham and nothing against billy graham you know he, uh, genuine people in many ways 
but they have not gotten the idea of the atonement being more than just letting you off the hook. They say, oh, yes, Jesus died for sins. Great. That's wonderful. That's only half the story. He died so that your possession of the kingdom, what you're potentially supposed to have as the gift from God, can be restored to you. It's like a civil law, law case where your uh, inheritance is given to you when you lost it. That's a major part. It's not just that you've been forgiven. That's great. That's only half the gospel. Come on, Billy Graham. With great respect to you and your people, Frank and Graham. Don't keep saying to me on television, if I die today, how can I be sure I'd be going to heaven? That just shows you haven't understood the New Testament. So let's work on that. It should be, if I die today, would I sleep in the grave until the kingdom comes? Would I then rule the world with Jesus? Does that not get your attention? You are going to fix the world with Jesus in the kingdom. That's the reverse of what happened in Genesis. It's an exciting story. Okay, with that opening uh, impression then, let's go to Genesis 1. I'd like to read round. Any Bible you have is fine. We're using the New American Standard Version, which is a good translation. The NAB, the Roman Catholic Bible, is a good translation, by the way, too. Credit to the Roman Catholics there. Okay, I'll start with Genesis 1. Do you want to read the whole of this first chapter? Is that it, or what should we do? Uh, yeah, we'll... Uh, right. Hold on. Yeah, we can start reading. Okay, I'll start with 1, Carlos 2, 2, and so on. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless, void, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Mm -hmm. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Together, these made up one thing. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the middle of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. And verse 8 says, God called the expanse heaven. Is it my turn? Anyway, let me do it. 8, God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning a second day. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Verse 10. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. Then God said, let the land burst forth with every sort of grass and seed bearing plant, and let there be trees that grow seed bearing fruit. The seeds will then produce the kinds of plants and trees from which they came. So if we see so he brought forth in vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Mm. Verse 13. Yep. There was evening and there was morning. 14. Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Mm -hmm. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night. He made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. Mm -hmm. Verse 18. Okay. okay. And to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Mm -hmm. Verse 20. And God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, 
Let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the water in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. Yes. And God said, Let the earth bring forth every kind of animal, livestock, small animals, and wild ones. And so it was. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then in verse 26, then God said, Let us make man adam in our image and according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky <coughs> over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And to an aggregate of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that lives on the earth, which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. Verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And it was evening, and there was morning, day six, sixth day. That's an amazing passage, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I want to remind you then of Jeremiah 27, verse 5. Let's just turn to that, so that you get your eye on it perhaps for the first time. But it's a remarkable comment on what we've just read. And Jeremiah, the weeping prophet who was so opposed by the people of his day, they didn't like him, they tried to shut him up, silence him. But in Jeremiah 27, was it? 27, yeah. verse 5, yes. 27, verse 5. I remember the exact day which I discovered this back in East Oregon days. I got up one morning, I, I read that, and I thought, my goodness, that is an amazing statement. So Jeremiah 27, I'm just finding it here. Um, verse 5, what about this for a good comment on Genesis 1 there? I, God, you know, if you're God, you have a right to speak out. I have made the earth. Wow. I've made the men and the animals which are on the face of the earth, by my great power and by my outstretched arm. Now, this is the part that really caught my attention. I will give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Isn't that a rather generous God? To give you, you look outside the window and you see the creation. It all belongs to you. Because God generously gave it to man. He failed desperately, didn't he? He listened to the serpent who lied to him. So then they were banished from the garden. If you're Jesus, you come along and you say, well, my goodness, I'm the second Adam. So what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the kingdom. Getting the kingdom back. Getting your inheritance back. That is simply amazing. I knew none of this in the Church of England days. I vaguely thought... That when grandfather died he was in a better place and i heard that phrase in my own home this last week uh, somebody was going to a funeral and they're saying well we know that he's in a better place what wait a minute everything is crying out to me so wait a minute where did you get that from so the doctrine of the immortal soul that when you die you go to heaven immediately actually kills the whole story it's all over right you're going to heaven when you die as an immortal soul that is absolutely numbingly bad. That's all we knew. And I heard the very same thing in my own home. Well, we're going to a funeral in Wales. 
and we know that so and so is now in a better place. What? No, 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 don't say that. You just contradicted the Bible. You're lying. You're letting the Bible mislead you. No, that's false. You're letting the Bible not tell you the truth. What does it actually say? Blessed of the meek, they're going to inherit the land or the earth. It's all about the land. It's all about this beautiful creation. So that's what I get from Jeremiah. Well, I've got a question here. Oh, the, yes, already. On the, on the two lights. Yes. The sun and the moon. Do you, yeah. do you think uh, there's apparently another solar eclipse? Uh, it's <laughs> April the 8th. Do you think it's a sign of Messiah Jesus returning? Oh, I have no idea whether, whether it is or not. We'll wait and see. There are signs in, if you look at the uh, six uh, angel series of angel seals. seals, thank you, six seals in Revelation, the heavenly signs appear to be the sixth one just before the end. The seventh would be the seventh trumpet. So, yes, uh, thunder, when I hear thunder. It's a sign of the second coming, but not the absolute sign of its imminence. So every time I hear the things or see the things, it's possible. But do remember that Jesus himself did not know when he was coming back. What he did know was that there would be trouble in the temple in the Middle East. There would be somebody called the Assyrian as an anti-Christian figure, and that person would wreak havoc. Why was why would God allow havoc to be wreaked, wrecked, or wreaked? Whatever the word is. Wrecked. would be wrecked on Israel. <laughs> Listen, the people of Israel, I'm talking about what we call Jews, wherever they may be, there are many of them obviously in the land of Palestine and around the world, they're in very bad shape. You know, they killed their own Messiah. What? The Messiah showed up eventually. What did they do with him? They killed him. That's absolutely amazing. God is going to get their attention. You know how he's going to do that? By wreaking the great tribulation time on them. That's going to cause them to wake up and say, my goodness, what have we done? And that will bring some of them at least to repentance. They will accept the gospel about the kingdom and they'll prepare to enter the kingdom and rule the world with the saints when Christ comes back. A comment from yes. uh, Tracy. We must know what Jesus said the sign of the end would be mm. when you see the abomination of desolation yes. spoken about by Daniel the prophet mm. standing in the holy place. Yes. Let the reader understand immediately yep. after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened. Yes. Then they will see the Son of Man arriving on the clouds of heaven with power, great glory. Matthew 24. Absolutely. Verse She's 15 and following. Put a finger on the on the central truth there, but there is little little matter of a pronoun missing there. Listen to this. Mark 13, 14, 13, 14, Mark 13, 14. When you see the abomination of desolation standing where? Next word. He. he. Where he, not it. So he. The abomination of desolation is a person standing where he ought not to. Mark 13, 14. You always stress that. Then, if you happen to be in that area, get out of it. Flee. Nothing about a so-called pre-tribulation rapture, by the way. That doesn't exist. The Hal Lindsay idea that Jesus will come back twice once for a secret rapture is false. There's nothing to do when you see all of that in terms of being raptured to heaven. No, no, you're going to have to flee. If you're in Jerusalem, you pray that it's not going to be on Saturday because the gates would be closed in the land and that would be more difficult to get out. And then we get to the heavenly signs. So we believe, I hope rightly, in a post-tribulational catching up to meet the Lord. When you, when the king comes to visit you, by the way, you go down to the end of your drive, don't you, to meet him and, ex and escort him in the direction which he's going. That's the image there. There's one in the book of Acts where Paul was going to uh, the area of Jerusalem. No, it wasn't Jerusalem, somewhere else in Asia Minor. And the people went out to meet him as a celebrator. That's the picture. So the queen comes to my house. I will go down to the end of the drive, escort her in the direction which she's going. That's what we're going to do. Finally be caught up. There is a rapture in the Bible, but not a pre-tribulation rapture, not even a mid-tribulation rapture, but a post-tribulational rapture, catching up to meet the visitor as he's coming to the earth to establish the kingdom. That's the story. Okay. Verse 22. Yes. 
hadn't noticed that God doesn't just bless humans, he blesses the fish and the birds. Yes. In verse 22, God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea. Yes. And let the birds multiply on the earth. So not that they understood what he was <laughs> saying, <laughs> but that he blessed them with all the functions and the capabilities yes. that they had. Yes. To do what they do. What they do. Fish and birds. That's right. Well, they are amazing. The animal world is quite yes. flat. I mean, it's exactly. creation. What about the hummingbird that goes off to Florida and showed up I, on the 28th of March, came back? That little hummingbird is an absolute miracle. I'm glad, glad for that. Yes. Sorry. Yes. How do they know how to do all that? How about Azalea Month in April? We have these native azaleas that native azalea experts come and get their magnifying glasses out there. So thrilled with all that. And I am too. Partly because Nanny, it's not grandmother, but Nanny, whom a lady was employed by my parents, she had this fascination with birds and things outside. I got caught some of that. But with Barbara being a master gardener, I'm particularly interested in that and I'm fascinated by it. But Sarah's right. The animals are amazing, isn't it? Are we taking all of this for granted? This is astonishing what's going on out there. Anthony, uh, yes. on the Imago Dei. Dei, the image of God. Absolutely. Let's make man, Adam in the Hebrew, let's make Adam, let's make man in our image, in our likeness. So mankind is a reflection of God. The idea is simply this, that God puts his representative in the garden that he was given. He creates this wonderful being, very generous, right? I want to give it to Adam. And Adam then represents God. He's the agent of God. And he's supposed to take care of the garden. So the question is, how well are we taking care of the garden? Not very well. But we should be taking care of the garden that God so generously gave to us. That's the picture there. That would be the image of God, reflection of God. You are like, you are like God. You see another human being, you're seeing something of God in every human being. Because let us make man in our own image. That would be let us and the angels listening there. The four let us texts in the Bible. There are thousands of let me do it. There are only four let us. In every case, the counsel of the angels was listening. So God was so thrilled with what he's doing, he involves the angels. Come on, let's let's make this extraordinary world. And that will yes. be uh, Job 38. So Yes, what's that one? As we know, just to address mm. the uh, elephant in the room. Yes. <laughs> Not the elephant created on the fifth day. <laughs> as we as we know that verse, Genesis 126, mm. uh, a favorite of uh, people who believe the one God is more than one yes. person, uh, i.e. Trinitarians. Yes. But the this is someone addressing others. Yes. It's not an internal conversation of three persons. No, no. So that's the first thing. Yes, we're not three persons at all. Let us. doesn't tell you how many thousands might be listening, but the point is God is speaking to somebody else right. on four occasions only in the Bible, whereas on thousands upon thousands upon thousands of occasions, God speaks of himself as I. God has his preferred pronoun, catching my reference there to the current discussion. God has his preferred pronoun, which is I, which is me, which is him. And don't you dare imagine anything other than Right, so the rabbinic understanding for many a millennia yeah. was that it was God the Father, yes. who Jews call Yahweh or Jehovah, yes. was addressing the heavenly core. Yes. Uh, the passage some years were, was Job 38. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is Yahweh addressing Job. Yes. Uh, who is it that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and yeah. I will ask you and instruct me. Yeah. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Good panel. Tell me, if you have understanding, yeah. who set its measurements, yeah. since you know, or who stretched the line on it, yeah. on that, on what were its bases sunk, mm -hmm. or who laid its cornerstone? When yeah. the morning stars sang together, mm -hmm. and all the sons of God shouted for joy. 
Now we'll, we'll come upon that phrase, Anthony, Sons of God in chapter six. Yes. But it's typically understood that's the angels. Yes, sons of God means angels in the Bible. Sons of God means angels and spirits. If you just take the word spirits as a class of person, it means angels or demons. We haven't got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight spirits in this room. <laughs> We've got souls, persons. That's very important. Souls. But spirits are angels or demons, and that's another story from Genesis 6. We'll get to another Sunday. Maybe. Right, so the point is that in Genesis 126, it's someone mm. addressing others. It's right. not, see, Trinitarians seem to be using this verse yes. to argue that it's, in, it's basically an internal conversation between three persons yes. who are God mm -hmm. among mm -hmm. themselves. Yes. I mean, that sounds schizophrenic to me. Yes. No, no, this is God addressing someone, and the someone, again, we side with the understanding for millennia. Yes. It was to his angelic court. Yes. His, his so family. there are four us texts in the Bible only. Four. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. How often do you have to say, I am God, there's no one else except me? The child is too understands that. Until you start messing with words, and then you've got a veiled polytheism or well, tritheism tritheism which is polytheism <laughs> and if you're jealous as god is and i can understand that i think thinking about this more if i had made the creation i'd be very jealous of somebody else pretending they'd made it as well that's just horrifying isn't it and what's important to note is that the following verse yeah god uh sorry where is it uh, mm. god created humans yes. in, his in his image own image yes in the image of god he created them so yes. it's clearly a singular self individual yes. and uh sarah has a something to share a note from the net bible it's good on verse it agrees with you verse 26 and yep. 27 uh, about the plural will let us in its ancient israelite context the plural is most naturally understood as referring to god and his heavenly court yes the most well-known members of this court are God's messengers or angels. Mm -hmm. If this is the case, God invites the heavenly court to participate at the creation of humankind, yes. perhaps in the role of offering praise, see Job 38. Yes. But he himself is the one who does the actual creative work, yes. verse 27. Of course, this view does assume that the members of the, hum of the heavenly court possess the divine image in some way. Since the image is closely associated with rulership, perhaps they share the divine image in that they, together with God and under his royal authority, are the executive authority over the world. That's exactly right. Did you get that? The executive yeah. authority of the world. You are being chosen. And God then calls you my daughter or my son. And he's delighted to give you control. And he's watching you now day by day. Are you fit to rule the world? That's the issue. Don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? I'm quoting you Moffat now from 1 Corinthians 6 too. Don't you know, Paul says, rather upset with his congregation, they didn't get it. Are you not aware of the fact that God is going to use you to rule the world? Currently, there's a discussion about the millennium, which is totally unnecessary and terribly deceptive. You are not in the millennium now, let me tell you. You're not. If you were in the millennium now, there'd be no Satan to worry about because he'd be locked away in the subterranean <coughs> abyss with a key, abyss with a key on it, right? So what about, well, watch out, the devil's trying to, to wipe you out like in First Peter, like a lion, you know, going around. That would be impossible. Our millennialism is a flat out rejection, I want to say powerfully this morning as I can, an absolute denial of the gospel of the kingdom. Don't go there. Did you know that in Revelation 20, it says, blessed and holy are those who are going to be in the first resurrection. How important is that? That phrase, blessed and holy, only occurs once in Scripture, in Revelation 20. Blessed, happy, successful, congratulations, and holy are the ones who have part in the first anastasis resurrection. And our millennialism says, oh, that's just conversion. No, no, that's wrong. Calvin is a very great danger to our system. It was Jefferson, one of your presidents, who said that Calvin was an atheist. 
I think he was right. Calvin is the guy who says double predestination. God has decided who's going to be saved before they did anything and who's going to be lost. What? That's an awful doctrine. Calvin is the one who says when in Acts 1 6, we'll refer to it to your notes, Acts 1 6, at the end of a six week discussion between Jesus and the disciples, they finally say, you can hear the breathless excitement. Wow, is it now time for the kingdom? What did Calvin say to that? Hallelujah? No, no, no. Calvin said there are more errors in that question than there are words. I want to tell you, Calvin did not understand the Bible. Calvin and Luther did not like the book of Revelation. Watch out for you tend the Lutheran church and all that stuff. Why didn't they like the book of Revelation? Because they didn't understand the gospel question here Anthony, yeah. on on day two yeah on the passage about day two verses six to eight mm. it's unclear to me what is the expanse okay it says waters above the expanse yes. below the expanse so yes you... yes that's a good word rakia in hebrew it means that it's it's defined there as the heavens you look up in the sky what do you see a vault it's the roof over our house it's it's the roof of the place we're dwelling. We're living in God's wonderful world. The rakia. Now, here's an interesting point. The Bible says that the birds are flying on the face of the rakia. Are they? No, no. The Bible wrong? No, no. Wait a minute. The Bible doesn't have to talk to you in scientific language as we now understand it. Guess what? If you're God, you don't talk to people in a language they don't understand. So people stumble at this. The birds, in fact, not flying literally attached to the vault, are they? It looks as though they are. Look up in the sky, the airplane appears to be attached to the vault. That's what the Bible says it is. So allow yourself a little freedom. People get terribly hung up on things like the gap theory. No need for that. Don't even argue about it. The Greek actually doesn't give us a the, the became word there. It could. If you want to believe in the gap theory, that's fine. It doesn't say anything about the gap theory it simply says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth anthony just on, yeah. on the expanse yeah so this person is trying to understand mm. because it sounds like there was water yes uh above that expanse, yes which, which yes today we would call space yes <laughs> right above the stratosphere so the the expanse would be today known as the stratosphere right the, yes the thin layer around around the world if i may say that so it sounds like there was water there oh yeah and there was water below the yes earth, as we know. yes yes uh, the point is that this is at the time of noah yes wasn't it like they were surprised yes that water came down that's right from the sky i know because up in the beginning of the, the garden right. of eden they talked about this mist that yes to water that's right beginning. so yes this is probably what talking about mm -hmm. that there was kind of a water layer you know, absolutely yes in the time of noah it started raining and then after that yes the new you know creation after noah mm -hmm. after the flood yes it just stayed that way that I, I think that's exactly right yeah, peter I mean, peter that. yeah we have a new world after the flood in peter you know he looks at this as the genesis creation is here and then you have the flood then you have a new world after the flood well, it wasn't literally a new world. It's a new system. Yes. It's not. It's not. Right. So when we get to the flood story, we'll read how God opened the doors. It's yes. Heaven, and yes. that water was was uh, flooded. On the flooded on the so it's not there anymore. No. Uh, and but if I not answer Nancy's question about what, what is this water above and water below, right. that's mm. a legitimate question. Yes. yes. It, seems, it seems there was, and mm. we see that in the flood got empty those waters and, uh, on the earth yeah. now let me read second peter 3 because yes. this might help uh, yes the question mm -hmm. so in second peter 3 the context is about those uh quote scoffers mm -hmm. people say oh you, you know, well, it's the sign of his back. coming he's not coming back he's right coming back what are you doing yeah. uh so let me start in verse three uh note this first of all that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lusts mm. and they say where is the promise of his coming yes for ever since the fathers fell asleep mm. they're not in heaven no all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation mm -hmm. 
for when they, the bad people, yes. maintain this, they, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago. The earth was formed out of water mm -hmm. and by water mm -hmm. or through water, mm -hmm. through which the world at that time was destroyed, yes. being flooded with water. Yes. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire. Yes. Kept for the day of judgment and destruction of all of ungodly men. Yes. So the point there is that it's re repeating the Genesis story. Yes. That says that there was just water mm -hmm. and chaos mm -hmm. and, and the earth arises or rises yes. up from the water. Yes. Yet there's also water. Apparently, yes. Outside. So you've got a, a new system after the flood. That's interesting, isn't it? A new system. And then you have another new system when Christ comes back and you have new earth. And you have the, the city, which is the bride, meeting the bridegroom. That, there's some interesting questions there. I don't know if you know that in the book of Revelation, you have the fact that one of the promises to the churches, if you do well, you're going to get the tree of life. Well, the tree of life, on some understanding, doesn't occur till another thousand years later after Christ comes back. That seems to me unlikely. So... The tree of life is what is promised to the churches. I don't think you have to wait another thousand years before you get the tree of life. So what, that's something to think about, certainly not to, to uh, decide one or the other particularly, but... I've got a, yeah. a comment here yeah. about, I guess we need to address another elephant in the room. <laughs> uh, there are two beliefs yeah. about the expanse yes. of flat earthers Mm. So people who do not subscribe to a globe mm -hmm. or, or a ball mm -hmm. uh, believe there is a dome over Earth, mm. which that would be the firmament. So, yes. so if you Google Flat Earth, you yes. see models yes. where they believe that when the Bible talks about the four corners of the mm. Earth, for mm. example, mm. so prophets talk about that. Yes. So they take that literally. Yes. Uh, it sometimes talks, of, talks about the edge of the Earth. Yes. So the dome or the expanse of the firmament yes. would be a type of, uh, you know, the snow globes. So, so that's pretty much it, the model uh -huh. of a flat earth. So if you understand. Yeah, that. well, my comment on that is they're making the mistake of treating the Bible as a scientific <laughs> book. And my, an my answer is it, it says in the Bible, if you read re literally, <laughs> the birds are flying attached to the brachia. They're not. I mean, the Bible's wrong. No, it meant that God spoke to those people in a language they would understand. You got the point? It says in the Bible that the rakia, the vault, which is like the, the dome, that's, that's what that dome word is, rakia, says the birds are flying attached to it. They're not. Well, let's panic then. The Bible's wrong. No, no. God can speak to people in language they understand, right? doesn't have to be we lost people in the church on this point by the way that's what it means a lot to me no no don't panic god can say that if he wants to i look up in the sky the airplanes are flying attached to the sky no they're not not literally but that's the way it looks i can live with that and, and just so relax make, a little bit on that one. just to make a disclaimer of our first version of fellowship, yeah we don't we're not in the habit of this fellowship <laughs> cutting people no, off. No, 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 no. So, you know, some Christians no. are dogmatic about this. Yes. And they leave. Yes. They leave our fellowship. They do. They stop talking to us. Yes. We can have disagreements like this, oh, yes. I believe. Oh, yes. And to me, anyway, and to yes. you, oh, yes. it's not a matter of no, all no. that's throw so No, I think, not. I think not. We've got two pilots in our, in our fellowship. Yeah. One pilot, they're both of them very much with us. One pilot is absolutely convinced the earth is flat. One pilot has become convinced. Has become, become convinced. And the other pilot says, no, no. I've seen that the earth is not flat by looking from the plane. So what do we do with that? There's something has gone wrong with the system. And it is namely that God doesn't have to speak to you in scientific terms. He can tell you that the birds are attached to the, to the sky. If he wants to say that, I'll live with that. Yeah, doesn't mean to say I have to think that is literally true. Yeah, Dan Shaw echoes the sentiment. He says the Bible uses metaphorical language yes. to expedite yes. details very often. Good word. 
And uh, Benjamin, mm. uh, well waters yes. came from above and below. There was probably a reservoir of water yes. uh, held above the sky. So, mm. yes, yes. Okay. That's good. So, uh, Thomas is right. We don't want to cut people off on those things. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate when they leave us because, you know, Anthony, you know, you're not believing the Bible because it says the birds are attached and you're not a believer. And yeah. I'm saying, no, you're reading the Bible as a scientific textbook in every case. Maybe it wasn't meant to be that. Just to explain a little bit. So, yeah. what happens is that many Christians mm. believe that. It is part of the satanic line mm -hmm. of the world mm -hmm. to make us think that we are not in the center of the so-called galaxy. Yes. It's the sun. Yes. So they say, oh, that's part of the pagan sun worship. Oh, I see. Uh, so they yeah. see it as a satanic thing and that if you buy into it, mm -hmm. what NASA says, what the government says yes. about the Earth, about yes. space, then you're demonized. Yes. Pretty much. That's right. We say... Mm -hmm. Look, we could have a disagreement on this topic mm -hmm. without calling each other demonized. Yes. Or saying that you're, you're buying a satanic lie. Mm -hmm. If you want to believe that what we think is a solid object called the moon is a mirage. Yes. Is, there is right, no not really there. If you want to think yeah. that, look, okay. Well, actually, it is not okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a case in form of insanity. Yeah, but we've had people somebody, leave. No, we shouldn't call people demonized over there. No, no, we can, we can regret the fact. I think they're mistaken because people no. have, I and mean, people as faithful as you guys, who we've known for years, have left us on this point. There is no moon, Anthony. There is no moon. We never went to the moon, and there isn't a moon. And these are otherwise intelligent people. Anthony, uh, yeah. Sarah wants to read something for us. No, Please. I just want to mention that Psalm 104. Good. What do you got? Commentary to Genesis 1. Yes. One. Please read. Um, I don't want to read all of it. Well, some. Um, so we can... Psalm 104. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Psalm 104. Comment. Psalm 104. Is yes. Poetic. Yeah, just Parallel. to show the, the metaphorical. Good. Oh, parallel. Okay, parallel. Good it's comment. The Bible yeah. commenting on itself is a good idea. <laughs> it starts out, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O yes. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a cloak, stretching out heavens like a tent curtain. Yeah. He lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He walks upon the wings of the wind. He makes the wind his messengers, flaming fire his ministers. He established the earth upon its foundations so that it will not totter forever and ever. He covered it with the deep as with a garment, the yes. water was standing above the mountain, yes. et cetera, et cetera. But it goes through and it, the animals, and I think it covers all the days of creation yes. in a poetic way. Good. That's wonderful. Now, that's not to say, by the way, yeah. that everything in Genesis 1 hmm. is a metaphor, it's not real. Like no, no. For example, the way we will go on if we get time. Yeah. The way we're created from dirt and all that. I yeah. take that as, as I would think so, and I would take the days as literal days. days right. You've got an evening and a morning, day one, day two. You remember that in the, the wedding at, in Cana, it was on the third day that they had the wedding. Why was that? Because in Genesis it said the third day was a very good day. So that was a good day to have a wedding. Apparently, the rabbis like that. Outside of Genesis 1, yeah. the, the Hebrew word for day or days, mm. there's no debate. No. Outside of this chapter, there's no debate no. about that word. No. When we get to this, mm. there's this big debate about the word. It, it reminds me of the Hakat issue. Yes. Outside of Deuteronomy 6, no, no. everyone knows what the word one in any language yes. is, except when we get to Deuteronomy 6. That's, that's, that's pretty, so yeah. that's to me, that's suspicious. Yes. Just yes. I know that the word, um, the word good um, features in this chapter uh -huh. in, in multiple, uh, multiple times. Uh -huh. And then it culminates in the last verse. Uh -huh. And God saw that it was excellent in every way. Uh -huh. So this is, there's nothing bad in this chapter. This is a feel good chapter. Yes. It's all good. Yes. Yeah. And then there's another phrase that that 
features, at least in my new living mm -hmm. translation. Mm -hmm. And that is, and so it was. It's five times in this. Yes. Mm -hmm. A very rich, reassuring verse. Yes, it is. Very, very um, descriptive of God. God spoke. Yes. And so it, it was. was. Mm -hmm. A lot. That's right. And that's the word then, in, and we'll throw this comment in, in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The capital W on word there is fatally misleading. The word word occurs in scripture over and over again. It's what God said. You are what you say. You are what you think. Your mouth produces words which reflect your brain. That's the word of God. It's power of wisdom, by the way. Now, that's what we call a personification. You can talk about wisdom being a lady. She's a lady, not literally, but as if she's a lady, personification. And the word word is similar. In the beginning was the word means simply God had an idea and spoke. So in Genesis, you've got God said, right? But that's what they're thinking about in John 1, 1. So it shows how easily distracted people can get. Yeah, the, the echoes, since you went there, mm, yeah. the echoes to the prologue mm. of John 1 are inescapable. Terrific. In this game. You have the phrase in the beginning, mm. not simply at a key. Times, it doesn't say the, does it? Sir? In the beginning? Is there a the in Hebrew? No, it says or in the be beginning. In beginning. In beginning, right. It could yeah. be in a beginning. It could be in the, be the beginning of now the world as we know it. The recreated earth mm -hmm. after the war with mm -hmm. Satan and all that, which is. Part of what the gap theory is, which I actually do believe. Yes. So uh, it, it could be, it doesn't, yeah. this, this is the beginning of the story of mankind on Earth. Yes. But there could have been a whole bunch of other stuff yes. that happened for aeons, yes. including the fall of Satan, yes. before this particular beginning. Yes. No, that's true. Because it's it true. says that the Earth was without yeah. form and void, yeah. which is what, when can we learn that? Tohu Yes, we did. Mean? Tohu Confusion, don't they? Yes. Did God create anything in confusion? No. Well, maybe not. No, that's possible. Uh, and then that's right. talked about how He created it to live. Now that could be when He created it. Yes. He recreated the yes. earth, reformed it. It became this beautiful place where we can live <coughs> for that mm -hmm. for aeons mm -hmm. of eternity. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. No. No, I, I think there's truth in that. The danger is that if Bullinger is followed, as with Armstrong, he tended, and the way international Bullinger oh, made some yeah. catastrophic mistakes when he said the gospel is not what Jesus taught. That's called dispensationalism. So one has to be careful with some of the ideas, but it's entirely possible. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, so what I was going to say was the parallels here to yeah. John 1. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. So you have that phrase in the beginning, not just beginning. Yes. Right. Uh, you also have the connections to Proverbs 8, mm. as you know, wisdom was with God when he established the heavens and the earth. Uh, you have let there be this phrase, mm. let there be mm -hmm. a, a yenetto mm -hmm. in the Greek, mm -hmm. is, you know, is in the prologue when it says, yeah. you know, it, it came to be. So, uh, yeah. I, on Michelle's point, one could say, what about John 1.1? 1, 1? You're going to translate that as in a, in a beginning? Probably not. So these are... Yeah, it has the light and the darkness in John yeah. one ten, as we know. Yeah. Uh, the old things, all things created mm -hmm. through it, not he, as yes. we always say. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think the, the the view that the prologue of John 1 is, is not about Genesis creation, as other... Unitarians believe, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think that that holds too much water. So. Uh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm open on all of those things. Although, when we say, "Well, you want we want you to search this out," you know, what does the Bible say? Wait a minute, are you equipped to even study this? Yes, in some way, in some way, not. Is is this problematic? We keep saying you've got to be brilliant. You've got to say, "What does the Bible actually say?" Well, people write to me all the time and say, well, Anthony, I just believe in the Bible. They just believe in the Bible. I don't read any commentaries. I just read the Bible. Well, what, what, who makes you supremely confident that you are better than thousands of commentators? Not necessarily. So you try to get some sort of balance. 
Got it, Bess. Um, you want to move on to chapter... Chapter 2, want to do a little bit more? What are we doing? Chapter 2, right, the creation of man and woman. We do want to stress the fact that man is in the image of God. Yes. The image is the representative of God. He's put there to do something. His job description, I like that phrase, Adam's job description was to rule over this place, wasn't it? it, is, it is it right to say to understand the image of God as God-like? Oh, more than that, that more knows. than that, Re oh, reflection of God, I think, just like God, you're, you're a... Well, uh, not quite yet like that, because we don't know who to do, as we would read, but it's, it's, there's a God Well, man is made in the image of God, I think would definitely mean man is made there to be the controller under God's right. arrangement. It's, it's not going to do, he's not going to sit there, gaze at the sky. Right. He's well, supposed to take charge of for God. So you're saying, you're saying we were created not just to look at God and, and no, praise him. No. And it talks him about subduing. It talks about subduing that word is strong there. So he made us as functional creatures to certainly, do stuff. Certainly. Job Tyrus description. Tyrus says it includes the natural likeness of intellect, emotions, and will. Good. Which obviously animals don't have. Yes. Well, to a degree, they yeah. might have. <laughs> Sun. Yes. 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 It was light before the sun. Yes. So it was like a godly, godly light, godly light and godly darkness. I guess. I mean, mm. God created the darkness too. Oh yes. Yeah. Uh, you want to do Genesis two? Yeah. Just before we leave that topic, one one excellent point is your job description. Man's job description is to be a king and a priest. That's in Exodus nineteen six. God said, here's your job description to his people, Israel. You are kings, firstly, and priests, both. Guess where that verse is taken by Peter, who knew what he was talking about? In 1 Peter 2, the international church, the Israel of God, the international true believers, they are kings and priests. You're representing God as a king or queen or priest. That's what man is supposed to be doing. That's very clear to me. So that connection between Exodus 19, 6 and 1 Peter 2 is brilliantly good for me. King and the priest. Royalty. Blessed and holy. The only place in the Bible where those two words come together. Blessed and holy are those who take part in the first Anastasis resurrection. They're going to rule the world for a thousand years. How's that? Methuselah was less than a thousand years old. Didn't get to rule the world for a thousand years. You get to rule the world for a thousand years. Don't tell me you're ruling the world now, because if you do, you drive Paul crazy in First Corinthians 6, where Paul says, some of, you, some of you think you're rich now. You think you're ruling the world? You must be kidding me. That's exactly what the Church of God people are now allowing in. They're actually allowing and licensing people who don't believe in the future millennium. They think you're now ruling the world. 1 Corinthians 6, 4 is the strong answer to that. You are not ruling the world. Satan is the god of this world. Satan is deceiving the entire world. You really think he's bound so he can't be deceiving the world? That's crazy. So it's possible for people, even who have the truth in some way, to be terribly misled. You've got to have some controls. The danger is it becomes autocratic. You know, you've got some one guru telling everybody else that doesn't work well either. So some sort of balance is... Two. Okay, Genesis chapter 2, let's see what we've got. I'll read verse 1, if I may. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their armies, all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he ceased to work. Mm. On the seventh day, from all his work, which he had done. Mm. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it, he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Mm -hmm. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that mm -hmm. the Lord God made earth and heaven. There were no plants or grain growing on the earth, for the Lord God had not sent any rain, and no one was there to cultivate the soil. And the mist used to rise on the earth and water the whole surface of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and 
creature who is not made of the breath of life, and then a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of mm -hmm. the garden, mm -hmm. and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now a river flows from Eden to water the orchard. And from there it divides into four head streams. The name of the first is Bishon. Mm -hmm. It flows around the whole land. Havelah, yes. Yeah, there is God. Mm -hmm. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure. Aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. Mm -hmm. The name of the second river is Gihon, and it flows around the whole land of Cush. Mm -hmm. The name of the third river is Tigris. Tigris, yeah. It flows east of Syria. Mm -hmm. And the fourth river is <laughs> 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From every, every, from any tree of the garden, mm -hmm. you may eat fruit. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God formed from the soil every kind of animal and bird. He brought them to Adam to see what he would call them, and Adam chose a name for each one. The man gave names to all the cattle, and to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper who was suitable for him. Mm -hmm. Twenty-one, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh of that face. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib, which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. Mm -hmm. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, although Adam and his wife were both naked, neither of them felt any shame. Yeah. Mysterious material, isn't it? Um, the woman is Isha and the man is Ish. Masculine Ish, Isha is the woman. And you know the story well from having attended weddings all your life. Um, what was I going to say here? Yeah, there's a correspondence between man and women. I said, what, why is that one tree forbidden? The knowledge of good and evil they shouldn't eat of that and when they did it was barred from them my understanding would be that they're not ready to handle that yet in other words you can't allow them this knowledge of good and evil until they've been trained to get it right that would be the idea so the one tree that was fatal to eat at that stage in the development would be the tree of the knowledge of good and life good and, and, and evil rather um otherwise adam is in charge right he's naming the animals you're giving the names to the animals my point is that god has given this to man and that's what i'm trying to get over this morning is the creation which is so marvelous outside is god's gift to you and god is training you and people say well, poor little me you know i'm not thinking wait a minute don't say that actually you're really something not to self vaunt ourselves i get that but god is very pleased to give you the world it gives him a great thrill what's the one in the gospels that says exactly that what i just said the luke 12. fear not don't be scared little flock god is and i'll translate thrilled to pieces to give you everything you see out there how about that 
That's a very generous God, isn't it? If you're God, you have a right to be terribly upset if somebody else is in there sharing that with you. Don't, don't go there. That really, make, to use the vernacular, drives God crazy. To have a second and a third God in the Godship, that's just wrong. So we're proud to tell you that God is one single person and that Jesus isn't God. And on that note, let mm. me address another question. Yes. <laughs> so Genesis 2.24. Yes. Uh, a man shall leave his father and his mother mm. and be joined to his wife and they shall become a yes. heart. Yes. One flesh. One flesh, and that's a favorite, as you know. Yes, yeah, so one flesh. But that's not two fleshes. The way to put that to your friends is like this. Okay, so you think if I say one zebra, I mean that one means black and white. You see the trick here? The devil is in the trick with words game. Or one tripod. One tripod. There it is. One oh, tripod. That means that one means three. Got it? No. The devil has words to trick you with. And that's why we need teaching. We need people to study, particularly on this R mill thing. The Church of God people have always understood that the millennium was coming in the future. They never imagined it was on now. There's a very famous quote that's, that's worth repeating from time to time. Henry Alford said about Revelation 20 in the millennium, if you say that the second resurrection is literal, but that the first resurrection is not literal, I quote now, Henry Alford said, there's an end to all meaning in words and the Bible is wiped out as a testimony to anything. That's what the Church of God is doing now. I want to say that publicly. <coughs> Take charge of that thing. Some of us labored to teach the millennium. And then they say, well, it doesn't say seek first the kingdom. It doesn't say seek first the millennium. It does. It's the same thing. The millennium is the first stage of the kingdom. Seek first that kingdom. You're going to rule the world for a thousand years. Uh oh, no. Yes. Sir, I have a question here. Mm. Um, in relation to seven days creation week, yes. do you think God has a salvation plan for 7,000 years, yes. which amounts to seven days? One day is as a thousand years. Yes. So I think that. I think that's as probably likely that he thought of 7,000 years or seven days. You get that in the end of Second Peter there. Talks about an age being a day, a day, like a day, uh, age, an age day. Oh. I think they're thinking in, in terms of probably so seven thousand. This is a Jewish yeah. thing to this day, then. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Certainly. Right. You're looking for the rest, the sabbatismos. You're not looking for a future Sabbath. You can see, by the way, how the Armstrong people deceived us here. How clever was that? Come on, Anthony. Ten Commandments. Come on. What does it say? keep the sabbath on saturday does he say that yes what he didn't understand was that there are two covenants he did not understand that i don't blame him we learned from those things but we were horribly misled by ignorance the man was absolutely not fit to tell you anything about greek or hebrew words that wasn't his field now he did talk about the kingdom i'm glad of that so we learned lots of good things but it's important to get that right. There's a new covenant and a new covenant, and not the same thing. So if you're trying to keep the Sabbath on Saturday, forget it. You're not doing yourself any good. You're actually undermining the new covenant, which is not interested in which day you keep holy. But the old covenant did do that. So Armstrong muzzled the two covenants. That's what we didn't know. Why didn't we know? Well, we didn't know. The so, talk. so those Anthony, since you're on the Sabbath, yeah. <laughs> so those who uh, argue that from these verses that God, yes, I, I guess the argument would be God kept the Sabbath at one point. No, the argument is God rests. It doesn't say that He commanded the Sabbath at this stage. Right, but they see that as a more yes, as an do. example. So right. therefore, is that how it goes? yes, think so. Sabbath from creation. Yes. Argument. Yes. Right, but the, the actual Sabbath word is not used, it just says seventh day, right? Yes, yes. The Sabbath. It doesn't say that he commanded the Jews to keep the Sabbath from that point on. Later on, it does say that the Sabbath, as a literal day, is the sign of the Old Covenant. The sign of the Old Covenant. Armstrong didn't tell us that. Come on, let me suck you into the Old Covenant. The whole book of Galatians was a screaming attempt to say, don't go there. 
So what did we do with the book of Galatians in the college? I was in the college five years. When we got the book of Galatians, we went, whoa, no, next book. We could not handle it. So before, uh, so before Moses mm -hmm. giving us the law. No, apparently not. Or no one before Moses. No, no one before Moses. Explicitly, it's it's the sign of the old covenant, right? A very important marker. Yeah. Yeah, because many people think mm -hmm. so. This this establishes an example yes. for humanity. Yes. But there's no scriptural no. evidence that no one. No. No, the Jews like to think that Abraham kept the Sabbath. That was imagined, actually. It, it felt good that Abraham surely must have kept the Sabbath. He, it doesn't say he did. The ledger does say it's the sign of the Old Covenant. So if you've gotten past that, that's a miracle, actually. You're, you're really very blessed to understand the two covenants. Anyway, the, the whole point of what we're doing here is this, it's very generous for God to give you this amazing creation i think i don't fully understand that having a master gardener <laughs> wife has helped a lot how is it that that hummingbird knows to go to florida and come back i mean how is that this is amazing uh do you have any comments on the garden of eden is that an it's an act it, the location it's a, oh absolutely it's a, it's a park it's a park it's a beautiful park that's what it means. The, the Gan Edan is the pleasurable park. Not where it is. Yeah, but oh, it's where? Like, it, it was where? a park. Oh, yes. <laughs> but, do you have yeah. any no, I don't, I don't know. Somewhere in the Middle East, it obviously. It seems like it's serious. It seems like the, the fertile crescent, the center yes. of the earth, basically. Where Between Euphrates and Tigris. Bad in the end. <laughs> yes. So yes. it was literally somewhere there in what today would be what? Uh, is think, that Syria? I think maybe Iraq. Yes, Iraq. Yeah. Iraq. Okay. Certainly, Middle East. Yes. The first of present, where civilization yes. began. Yes. Mesopotamia. 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 Yes. Mesopotamia. Between the rivers. Right. Between the rivers, between Euphrates and the Tigris. That's right. Okay. All I know is that God was trying to give good stuff to His children. You know, don't don't parents do that? Uh, my parents loved loved us a lot. And that's what a father does. I want to give you pleasure. Let me give you this wonderful thing. So we need to embrace that. Yes, that's right. right. There's not one spot on earth that's so no. obviously it's the east of Jerusalem. Right. Yes. Right. His, his, his favorite spot. He had a big spot on earth. Yes. You know, and that was it. Yes. So the so the yeah. of yes. I think I'm learning that in old age to appreciate this. A lot of the Bible language can easily go to the top of your head, you know, praise God, great, you know, all that, all that stuff. It's a book about royalty. It's a book about privilege. Blessed and holy stars shining are those people who do so and so. Yeah. Can you give us a little insight into uh, verse 7? Um, I'm going to say the Bible says eight and nine about the tree this is the tree the significance and what's the deal with the yeah the uh, tree of knowledge of, well apparently the the, the tree, tree of the knowledge of good and evil was, was a very godlike thing to have but it wasn't the time for them to have it there are two trees so yes the two trees tree of, tree of life and, tree and the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil i think if you get the tree of knowledge and good and evil you, you become responsible would be the idea you become responsible for getting it right and they weren't ready to handle that so they should have stayed away from it the devil knew that the devil tempted them and then eve made the mistake adam made the mistake they jointly made that mistake and the, even the childbirth thing is interesting isn't it child the pain the pangs in childbirth are a reminder apparently then of where man went wrong my understanding is i could be wrong here my understanding is that you don't want to get the tree of life and live forever until you've got control of the good and evil thing. You, you've got to be able to handle that. And that takes training. And you and I, I think, are learning the difference between good and evil now. Where, as Sir David Riley used to say nicely, we're training for reigning, schooling for ruling. It's all about who gets to rule the world. That's what, what I've been thinking about so much you know, over the last months. Wake up thinking about it, go to sleep thinking about it. Trees were a way to have something 
yeah. that's tangible, that was basically an, an idea yes. of God, God's mind, yes. uh, his plan, whatever, right. but that the tree was some tangible thing to, yes. that they could see and look at. I would think so, so yes. His thoughts? Absolutely. And the danger is that once you are exposed to the truth of good and evil, then you become responsible. That's that famous thing we discovered in you know, as a group. Uh, some years ago in John 16, Jesus said this, this remarkable thing. If I hadn't come and told you, you wouldn't be guilty. But now that I've told you, you're guilty. The more you know, the more you're responsible for what you have. So God said, stay away from that knowledge of good and evil at this point, right? But they didn't. The devil got them deceived. The idea that there is no devil is absolutely extraordinary to me. The idea that you are the devil is simply wrong. We could they tried to teach us that in England with him. So I, th I think I think that's the idea. This makes you responsible. Once you have taught the difference between good and evil, then you can be guilty if you don't get it right. So God withholds that at that stage and puts up what angels and so on with swords, keep them away from that. But now I Jesus know, comes. Know, there. No. Doing the right thing. Eating, no, no. Not eating from the trees. He wasn't no, doesn't say it doesn't give us the time time thing. That's right. Uh, question yeah. here, Anthony. Mm. Uh, back to the Sabbath mm. issue. Yeah. Sabbath um, what do Sabbatarians do with Jesus literally breaking the Sabbath? Yes. I have never understood how they would handle a verse like John five seventeen, mm -hmm. uh, where it says Jesus was healing once again on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish leaders were persecuting him. And then Jesus says, My father is working until now. Yes. And I was Sabbath. Yes. And I too am working. So yes. what would a Sabbatarian? Well, with great difficulty, because that's the new covenant. We in Armstrong days couldn't have dealt with that very well. But Jesus is clearly not observing the Sabbath. I am working on the Sabbath. My father's working. That doesn't sound to me as though the seventh day is now binding on us. I don't think it is. It was good learning experience. I see that. It was a good God one. Just created ethics on that. God's creating. It doesn't yes. Mean he just he was tired. Took nothing. a nap and <laughs> let all creation go crazy. That's true. Or that he was tired from creation. Yeah. 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 That thing about the covenants is quite is quite. Uh, quite telling the, the famous one in Luke 22 where Jesus says I covenant to give you the kingdom that's the same promise that's given to Adam here's the world Adam this is yours I now covenant is what the Greek says there I covenant to give you the kingdom. that's the whole deal agreement between God and man to give you this marvelous thing out here oh no I'm going to go to heaven and play hearts on pink top no 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 you're horribly wrong. Now, God deals with that. I understand that. But I'd be very jealous for my position. If I were God, I'd be very jealous that people understand that. His preferred pronoun, he's not going to mess with. I. How many times do I have to say I before you know it's one person? Isn't that amazing? So that, that takes us then into the communion, and Carlos is going to do that for us. Yep. Uh, with reference also not only to the atoning death, I think you're hearing what I'm trying to add to the story here. Jesus died for your sins. Great. You're off the hook. So what? Big deal. I'm not going to die for my sin. So what? So that you can now get your inheritance back that you threw away. See that? That's the other level involved in the atonement. Is that you get back your real uh, intention from God is to give you. I, I get a great sense of the generosity of God. Fancy giving you this stuff here. What's that about? That's amazing. We need to stress that. Okay. All right. So we'll do community yep. service. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Amen. Especially those who got extra up extra early to come. <laughs> extra early? Extra okay. early. It wasn't that extra. So uh, just a brief message for me. How much more the blood of the Messiah? Yes. So that's from... Uh, a reference to Hebrews chapter 9. Mm. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. Mm -hmm. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, mm -hmm. heifer sprinkled yes. on those who are unclean purifies them physically, mm -hmm. 
how much more mm. will the blood of the Messiah, who through the eternal spirit, offer himself unblemished to God, mm -hmm. cleanse our consciences from dead actions, so that we may serve the living God. Yeah. This is why the Messiah is the me mediator of a new covenant. I like this passage because the point is that under the old covenant system, mm -hmm. under God's laws given to Moses at Sinai, he commanded that certain animal uh, be sacrificed. So a single lamb, a goat, a mm. cow, even a bird. Or a heifer. Or a heifer. Or yeah. a whole group of animals yeah. sometimes. And it's interesting to me because God saw that as acceptable mm -hmm. to cover the sins, not only of an individual, but of the whole nation of Israel. Uh, so even though animals, says this passage, have far lesser value than any human person, mm -hmm. God nonetheless deemed their spilled blood sufficient yes. Yes. to right. cover the sins of the whole nation mm -hmm. uh, of Israel. And even the land, because the understanding back in the day, in the Old Testament days, was that the sins of the people actually infected the land itself. Yes. So the land needed to be cleansed mm -hmm. as well because of their disobedience. Uh, so if this was the case with animals, how much more will the blood of his own uniquely procreated mm -hmm. human son, mm -hmm. the Messiah, be for our benefit? So a good question for those who believe the Son of God was God himself, mm. It's about this uh, this understanding that if God deemed animals who are far lesser valuable valuable than a human mm -hmm. uh, good enough, how much more His own human Son? Because the understanding, as you know, by the Jesus is God movement, as they call it, mm. is that only God could do it. God, you know, only God can atone for the infinite. Yeah. Eternal sins yes. of the world. Only God could do that. Yeah. So that is, to me, blasphemous. Yes. And to the scriptures, it's a blasphemous it concept that God would suffer, that God would shed his blood and somehow die. I mean, that's blasphemy 101. Mm -hmm. It should be ended. Mm -hmm. So we'll pass. The bread, as is the tradition and custom, mm -hmm. and I'll read a little bit from First Corinthians 11, as we usually do. Yeah. So Paul says to the church at Corinth, "For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when when he had given thanks, he broke it, as we have done." and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As we now pass the wine. Mm -hmm. Again, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul said, In the same way, Christ mm -hmm. took the cup also mm -hmm. after the his last Passover meal and said, This cup is the new covenant yeah. in my blood. Do this as often as you mm -hmm. drink it mm -hmm. in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he, he comes. comes. Yes. So we say Maranatha and we'll pray. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> Mm 
So that was the teaching of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. Mm -hmm. In the previous chapter, mm -hmm. uh, in chapter 10, mm -hmm. uh, Paul says, So, my dear friends, run away from the worship of idols. Mm -hmm. I am speaking to you as to reasonable people. Wow. <laughs> okay. yeah. Judge for yourselves what I say. Mm -hmm. We give thanks for the cup of blessing, which is a sharing in the blood of Christ, and the bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ because, and here's the key, Pinchin. there's one loaf of bread. Mm -hmm. We who are many are one body because we all share in that one loaf. So yeah. there's no divisions or there shouldn't be. Yeah. There's a unity of faith, mm -hmm. a unity of spirit, a fellowship. Now, if there is not, we must struggle. We must attain the unity of spirit and faith. Mm -hmm. So I don't like this talk of, you know, sometimes I hear people say, Carlos, this, there's never going to be unity. <laughs> We're all individuals. We're, we all interpret certain scriptures differently, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. True. I'm not a such an idealist, <laughs> but... There is a command, and Anthony has expressed mm -hmm. this. Paul yeah. commands the churches to seek to be united. Yes, that's right. In the bond of peace, mm -hmm. obviously speaking the truth in love mm -hmm. and respecting each other mm -hmm. as we should. Mm -hmm. Anyway, outside the church, outside yeah. of religion. So let yeah. me pray for that unity Good. of faith. Thank you. And once again, thanks everyone who came. Mm. Father, we thank you for the the incredible creation yeah we thank you for this uh, words you gave to your servant moses mm -hmm. yes father i wake up i look up and i marvel mm -hmm. at the world i marvel at creation your creation father that that you have given us that you made you made all this for us it's incredible mm -hmm. one day we will inherit it we will get it back Mm. But for the time being, we must go through through many trials and tribulations, learn <laughs> how to be good rulers, mm. learn how to be better than Adam and Eve. Yes. And we thank you for your son, mm. Father. We thank you for his sacrifice. And Jesus, we also can pray to you. We can also tell you mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. for your sacrifice. We pray for those less fortunate than us. We pray for this fallen world, the violence, the mayhem. Mm. We pray your kingdom may come. And we pray for our enemies and those who seek to cause us harm and to keep us free from the wicked one, Satan, the devil. Yes. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless everyone until we meet again. What was the passage oh. you read the whole thing from oh, yeah. Isaiah? Isaiah 60. Good memory. Isaiah 60. He read the whole chapter for us. Marvelous. Whole chapter. And my eye falls on this to conclude our words this morning. Therefore, since we are destined to receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe, because our God is a consuming fire. How about that? Book of Hebrews, let's do it again sometime. Uh, that was verse what? This is Hebrews, oh, Hebrews. chapter 12, oh. verse 26 onwards. Yet once more, I'm going to shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of things which can be shaken, as the creator things so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain therefore we are destined to receive a kingdom do you hear that god wants to give you this whole world that's the gospel they won't tell you that that's the gospel all right thanks everyone until yep. we meet up again